Um, we have two lectures um, today, one this morning, and then after this morning's lecture, we're going to have lunch, which will be put out in the same room in Redwood Conference Rooms. But during lunch, there's a string quartet that's going to be playing in this room. So we're invited to bring our lunches back here and listen to the concert if you're interested. <laughs> um, after lunch, between 1 and 1.30, you'll be able to set up your posters. So we'll have the posters in the Redwood rooms, and we'll have some poster easels. So you guys can set up your posters during that time, and then we'll get started with our last lecture again at 1.30 and go immediately after to, to the poster session. All right, I think those are my only announcements. Thanks, Amy. So good morning. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce Tony Heinz, uh, who's giving 45-minute uh, lecture on ultra-fast dynamics and 2D materials, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, your last day. I hope you had a nice, uh, nice time here so far. I can't promise to be uh, quite as enjoyable and uh, relaxing as your uh, activities later yesterday. But uh, I'd like to tell you something about, a, I, I think, an emerging area of application for ultra-fast x-rays. Let's see, we need to switch the switch over the slides if we could. Quite a few buttons here. Okay, here we are. All right, so my, my name is Tony Hines and I'm uh, affiliated with, with Stanford and Slack and a lot of my interests involve this recently developed field of 2D materials. So in, in uh, my lecture today, I'd like to cover three, three topics. Uh, first, a little bit about background on 2D materials, for those of you who haven't heard too much about that. A little bit about ultra-fast dynamic studies in these materials to give you a sense of why they're important and what can be learned. And then a little bit about the intersection between X-ray studies and ultra-fast. So I should say the amount, the amount I could talk about this is almost infinite because it's been a very, very rapidly growing field. It's, it's uh, only about 10 years old, but it's attracted a huge amount of interest. Uh, I could talk quite a bit about this because a lot of people have been doing ultra-fast dynamic studies in 2D materials. This one, I can almost summarize the whole field because it's an emerging field and it's the intersection between uh, you know, two, two important, exciting emerging fields, each of which is only about 10 years old. So the intersection is actually pretty small but I hope I'll convey that uh, it's an area where there might be a lot of interesting opportunities for some of you to think about how you could apply what you've learned in other parts of this course and in your work to uh, a new class of materials. So that's the plan, a little about each of these. So what we're talking about is really epitomized by the, the prototypical uh, 2D material, graphene shown here. So you'll recall this is this hexagonal uh, array of carbon atoms, just one monolayer thick. And uh, it, it burst on the scene a little more than a decade ago when it was first isolated by exfoliation. Uh, as I'll just briefly indicate, it's uh, first of all really something you can think of material. It's sufficiently stable even though it's only one atomic layer thick that you can treat it uh, you know, like a material that can be grabbed and stretched and studied and characterized. And it has some very distinctive properties and this is uh, so I'll also point out to you uh, uh, sort of only the tip of the iceberg because there are many other 2D materials that people uh, started looking into after understanding uh, the unique aspects of graphene. But just to, to show you one uh, fun picture to prove that this is really a, a material and interesting one, I like this uh, AFM image where uh, Paul McEwen's group in Cornell showed that you could basically blow a, blow a bubble in uh, a monolayer of graphene. And in fact, even uh, the, the smallest atom you can have in gas phase, helium, won't diffuse through this because you can have a, a membrane that basically has no defects. And uh, you know, this uh, work uh, headed by the Manchester group led to a Nobel Prize and they always have, have to have a nice way of explaining to the general public that you know, this is really an, an interesting and unique material. So if you look in the, uh, in the, the talk that was given for the, for the Nobel Prize, they have uh, this illustration here, oops, uh, 
which is actually correct if you work it out. If you, if you determine the strength of the, the monolayer of graphene, you'll see if you have a very light kit in and you imagined getting this with absolutely no defects and strung up as a, as a hammock, it would support that weight. So this shows um, you know, one, one of the outstanding properties of these monolayer materials that because you can pr prepare them without defects and the way uh, defect propagation works, you, you get unusually high strength, basically the fundamental strength of the, of the chemical bonds in the material. Well, from the point of view of, uh, you know, scientific uh, exploration with photons, uh, this, this kind of thing also suggests that you can do many interesting experiments, not only with uh, these monolayers uh, supported on defined substrates, but even suspended samples, as is indicated here. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, flexibility, not only in terms of the types of applications, but in the ways we can study the materials. So uh, this isn't always the case, but we do have this ability to investigate these 2D materials in a wide variety of environments. And when you can do this, you can also uh, easily imagine that you can investigate the uh, way in which the environmental factors alter the 2D materials, for example, uh, by the presence of other surrounding materials, by applying strain, uh, by looking at the influence of drawing electrons into this uh, membrane, and so forth. So before I say a few more words about the properties, uh, l let me give you two quick slides about where these things come from. Um, well, in, in our own laboratory, uh, even though we're not really material synthesis people, you know, following on the pioneering uh, work at Manchester, we, we developed this graphene production facility, uh, as it's known. So you, you probably all heard you, the, the way you get these is by, uh, with Van der Waals materials in 2D sheets with weak interlayer bonds. You can use the scotch tape method to successively exfoliate the material. So it's a, it's a little bit uncontrolled from a fabrication point of view, but actually it allows you to isolate very well-defined monolayers, bilayers, trilayers, and so forth. And uh, I, I have to say the, the uh, technology uh, for that initial step actually hasn't evolved all that much. But what's evolved is the class of materials one puts here besides graphene. But I, I, I should uh, you know, mention that although this, this provides uh, very high quality uh, monolayer flakes and so forth, when, when you start with a good quality bulk crystal, it's not something that can be easily scaled up. Uh, on the other hand, when people got the idea that uh, a particular you know, material is very interesting, like graphene, then they went to work in, in material synthesis in a more conventional way. And you can, for example, now buy sheets of graphene this, this occurred not, not too long after the original like, demonstration of graphene that, you know, scale this up through um, chemical vapor deposition and other bulk synthetic approaches. So they, although the, uh, perhaps the best uh, developed materials or the best quality materials come from this exfoliation, uh, with work you can anticipate making practically all of these in, in really uh, large scale. And from the point of view of x-ray experiments, uh, actually, you often want a larger sample to do these in grazing incidents, so the availability of things other than exfoliated materials is actually quite important. Well, aside from the uh, mechanical and uh, structural properties, what, what's interesting about 2D materials, they can often have very unique electronic properties. You've probably all seen this. This is the electronic dispersion relation for graphene. Uh, it gives you these uh, electrons that behave with uh, quasi-relativistic properties. Uh, of course, this is in this dispersion relation. This is not the speed of light here. It's the uh, characteristic velocity for the electrons in graphene. Uh, but this, this is uh, correlated to uh, not only to these mechanical properties like high thermal conductivity, but also to very interesting electronic properties, very high electrical conductivity, tunable electronic conductivity by doping and so forth. So this was sort of the prototype uh, material that launched excitement. Uh, but it became apparent then when, when people started thinking a bit more broadly that uh, although graphene um, you know, was maybe a, a, a very uh, nice example, it wasn't unique. And uh, pretty soon people sort of set side by side the, this structure with all carbon atoms with one where you alternated between carbon and nitrogen. And although they look like a very nice pair, in fact, from the electronic property, they're very different. So this is a semi-metal, and this is a wide gap insulator. And also, although their lattice spacing is quite similar, it's a little bit different. So when you combine the two, you get very interesting kind of interference patterns in the structure. Uh, 
beyond the, the, the metallic-like system in the insulator, uh, what um, actually emerged as a very interesting structure was starting with another very well-known bulk material in the layered structure, which is a molydisulfide or transition metal dicongenides. So you can get this, this stuff as a dry lubricant. And actually, it's also a layered material. It can be exfoliated. And you get uh, monolayer structures that look a bit more complicated than graphene. But in, in contrast to the graphene properties, these have a band gap. And consequently, from the point of view of light matter interactions, are, are, are very interesting and significant. And uh, just to show you, you know, one of the intriguing properties that we discovered early on for light matter interaction, if, if you uh, take one of these materials and you're exfoliated like the graphene, you can get these uh, monolayer flakes or uh, flakes. And this, this is a look, look at an optical microscope. You can see the monolayer part and you can see the bilayer part. And it's a very, very nice kind of material that you can suspend over these holes in the substrate and so forth. Uh, but one thing we observed was that uh, if you illuminate this with the laser and then you look for light emission, you actually see a nice image of this monolayer part, but you don't see the bilayer. And that's because although the interlayer interactions are pretty weak, they're still strong enough to alter the electronic properties. And this turns out to be a direct band gap uh, semiconductor in the monolayer region, but it's actually an indirect gap material when you, when you combine two in the bilayer. So you have very... Uh, interesting and important tunability of the electronic structure with layer thickness. So that's just a couple highlights of some of the you know, exciting things that have been discovered in 2D materials. It uh, is still a very rapidly growing field. Um, so in addition to these uh, three classes of materials I mentioned, like the metallic or semi-metallic graphene, uh, the semiconductor materials like molydisulfide, the insulators like hexagonal boron nitride, uh, people have now started looking for all sorts of ordered phases uh, that you would be familiar with from bulk materials, and they can be manifested also in 2D materials. So uh, uh, ferromagnet, ferromagnetic materials have been identified down to the monolayer piezoelectric materials, superconductors at the monolayer level as well. So it's uh, a, a growing material with lots of uh, interesting new properties to be explored. Perhaps uh, even more intriguing than these individual ingredients is the notion that uh, unlike in regular chemical growth, we have a lot of constraints uh, for these weakly interacting materials. You can imagine basically taking any one of these things and stacking it on top of another. So uh, you can, at least in your mind's eye, picture taking any, any of those ingredients and combining them essentially at will through uh, various types of mechanical manipulation processes and making your own uh, crystal or multi-layered structure. And uh, although this might seem a little bit optimistic, uh, optimistic scenario with those sort of uh, fairly primitive macroscopic transfer techniques, in fact, the, uh, the, the weak interaction of the materials means that adsorbates don't collect too much on these. And in fact, you, you can stack materials, and if you do it right, you can get things like this. This is the electron uh, micrograph image, and it's actually uh, hexagonal boron nitride, one layer of graphene and hexagonal boron nitride, which were stacked together by hand and produced this uh, almost perfect uh, crystal graphic structure. Well, the atoms are not a registry, but you can see you, you, you produce a you know, very, very nicely uh, spaced material with uh, very little intercalated contaminants. Well, uh, so that's uh, a few high points about uh, the, wh what, what's been motivating us in the field of 2D materials. Let me now say a few words about some of the ultrafast studies that have been done and what, what we can learn using ultrafast optical techniques. So this will be uh, a, a very partial survey of uh, some of the things that are, have been done and a little bit oriented towards describing the X-ray studies that have been done to date. Well, let me start with the prototypical material, uh, graphene. So the simplest kind of optical experiment, ultra-fast optical experiment you can do with a pulse laser is basically, uh, you know, having a strong pump pulse uh, with whatever photon energy you have and then looking at the transient response. 
And that turned out actually, to, that simple experiment turned out to be a pretty interesting thing to do. So uh, this is the kind of uh, a, a time domain um, probing of, of a graphene monolayer that can be uh, uh, obtained straightforwardly. So you can look at the, the transient reflectivity. It's, it's actually a pretty weak modulation, but you know, using lock-in techniques and so forth, you can see weak modulation. And if you, if you uh, photo excite with a short pulse, this would be you know, sub 100 femtosecond pulse, you get a very fast response. You get this quick transient that decays off in a couple picoseconds, and then you get a much longer tail. So it turns out there's lots of information in this. Um, one, one of the things that is occurring on the slowest time scale, but is actually quite important, is uh, understanding this long tail. So you put a lot of energy in the system, and then on a time scale of a few tenths of picoseconds, you see this decay here. Well, we, we know from our understanding of characteristic time scales that uh, after, after tens of picoseconds have elapsed, you're in a regime of near equilibrium behavior, not total equilibrium, but approaching equilibrium. And, and so the natural interpretation here is that this is some kind of temperature-dependent reflectivity. So uh, what you're seeing is a, after uh, putting energy in the system, you're seeing uh, a thermalized regime and a decay in the temperature. And what is, what is causing this loss of energy? Well, this is actually the fact that we're studying, in this instance, graphene not suspended away from the environment, but in a sort of a typical uh, situation you'd think of for making devices, which is graphene sitting on, on a substrate. So this is actually a way to look at interfacial heat transfer. So we're looking at the thermal conductance, the flow of heat, and actually the limiting factor is the flow of heat out of the graphene into the substrate. And the, the way we can know this is if we look not at one layer of graphene, but of samples of varying thickness, we see the initial transient that I'll describe to you in a moment is rather similar, but these tails actually get longer and slower the more material we have. So for one layer, the decay time is, uh, say, 30 picoseconds. If you have uh, 10 layers or so, then the decay time is 100 picoseconds or more. So what's going on there is you have a greater amount of heat in the graphene, it thermalizes within the layer, and then the uh, decay of the temperature is dictated by the interfacial thermal conductance. So in fact, this was one of the, um, these experiments provided w one of the first and, and I think most reliable ways of determining this important parameter, how the graphene interacts with an external environment and how uh, heat is transferred out of, the, out of the graphene. So that's an interfacial thermal conductance or boundary thermal conductance coefficient that could be inferred from these kinds of measurements. Uh, then, then there's also this much more rapid feature, and uh, that goes more into the kind of fundamental non-equilibrium physics of the system. If you look at this on a little bit uh, expanded scale, you see you get, uh, again, a rise time that's uh, more or less dictated by the duration of the laser pulse that we used in this case, and then you get a fall on they fall off in a, a time of about two picoseconds. So actually, in this, in this regime, there's even more going on. There's a, a regime, a very fast regime, where the electrons are of equilibrium with one another. They come into equilibrium with one another. And you can then, uh, for most of this, describe it in kind of a two-temperature model, where the electrons are characterized by one temperature, but they haven't transferred the energy to the lattice. So this uh, kind of transient response corresponds to the electrons coming into equilibrium with the lattice. And uh, this allows us to study very important fundamental physical parameter in the problem, which is the electron phonon coupling time. Okay, so uh, that's a, a little survey of some of the uh, interesting ultrafast dynamics that can be studied in the prototype 2D material of graphene. What if we look at the uh, semiconducting system? Uh, it's epitomized by something like molydisulfide, a TMDC. Well, the, the new ingredient you have here is a band gap. So in the case of graphene, the electronic excitation all relaxes because the electrons in holes can, uh, don't have a, a gap and they can recombine very quickly. Here you have a somewhat more complex series of dynamics. Uh, if you excite with a short pulse, you first generate hot carriers. Uh, the hot carriers thermalize with one another by electron-electron interactions, but they stay in their respective bands. Then they're uh, 
processes that, that uh, we mentioned. You can uh, have the hot carriers cooling by interaction with phonons. Uh, the whole system can cool by interactions with the external media. In addition to that, though, you have a distinctive kind of carrier dynamics because the electronic excitation um, doesn't relax as fast over the band gap. So there's um, more going on, and you can learn more from uh, time-resolved studies. Uh, here's an illustration of um, what happens on kind of a, a tens of picosecond time scale, like what I saw for the thermal conductivity. Uh, it's actually a similar measurement, transient absorption. You excite uh, a, a monolayer of one of these materials. Then uh, you look at the decay as a function of uh, the amount of excitation you put in, and you see decay times on, on the orders of on the order of here maybe 10, 10 picoseconds and at low excitation densities of much, much slower decay. So this, this is reflecting the fact that you're creating a lot of electrons in holes on, a time, on this time scale. They, they thermalize and actually they thermalize with the phonons. Um, and then this uh, decay reflects the fact that the electrons in holes are recombining with one another. So one way that can occur is through radiative emission, right? You can emit, you can have recombination by luminescence, like what I showed you in that picture before. But uh, actually, the, we, we knew there was something else going on here that was interesting, because when you excite with the low density of electrons and holes, you get a very slow decay. When you excite with a high density of electrons and holes, you get a fast decay. Anybody know what that is? OK, that's, that's a kind of uh, many-body interaction where uh, to, to, uh, an electron and hole recombine and they transfer the energy to another particle. So it's an OJ recombination effect and it's density dependent. So this is actually very important in understanding electron and electron interactions and also uh, in understanding uh, the efficiency with which light emission can occur. And uh, you, you can actually get much more details if you do this in a spectroscopically resolved fashion. This is the same kind of transient measurement, but looking at uh, the absorption feature near the band edge, uh, which actually is related to excitons, not free particles. So th these are sort of characteristic time-resolved measurements where you look at the transient absorption spectrum. Uh, this is with high pump excitation, low pump excitation. And uh, as, as in, uh, you know, X-ray spectroscopy, you, you really want to analyze all of this carefully. Uh, you, you don't want to just sort of look at some uh, very basic feature like the area, but you can do a complete analysis of, uh, you know, the area, but also uh, the, the center of the line, the width, and so forth. And from this, we found that actually you got a signature not only of the number of carriers, which would be reflected in the area of this peak, uh, but also something about their interaction with the environment, which in this case is the phonons. So the energy of the peak shifts with the, basically with the temperature. So if you look at the peak shift, you can infer the number of, uh, number of vibrations and number of phonons in the system. But the phonons also determine the width of the peak by scattering with the excitons. So we had two different ways of learning about the phonons. And if we put those together, we can infer two different, two ways of uh, determining the, the temperature of the phonons. At early temperatures, they don't agree because the system is out of equilibrium between the electrons and phonons. At later times, they do agree. So uh, you, you can, you know, through uh, piecing this together, you can begin to understand uh, all of these phases of electron-electron interaction, non-rated recombination, transfer of energy to the lattice, and in this final phase, the cooling of the lattice. Well, these heterostructures also provide very many interesting opportunities to look at ultra-fast dynamics. Uh, I think in, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip over that example because I want to be able to say uh, something about uh, the, the emerging X-ray studies. But just to maybe give you an idea of what you can do with optical, the simplest thing is you have you know, very good sensitivity to temperatures. So you can look at all sorts of properties related to heat flow in different contexts. Uh, it's a direct probe of the electron dynamics or the exciton dynamics. And if you, if you do this with looking at the photo emitted electrons, then you can explore not only vertical transitions, but a bigger part of the Brillouin zone. But on the other hand, if you want to probe the phonons, it's pretty indirect. I mean, you get signatures of the phonons in the electronic structure, and I've illustrated that briefly, but it's pretty incomplete and imprecise. You don't really know exactly what phonons you're looking at. 
so you don't really have any kind of direct handle on the structural dynamics. So you, you may infer from this that uh, you know, these are great techniques and you can learn a lot, uh, but there's, uh, I think, a great opportunity to make use of uh, x-ray techniques. And what, what are some of the things that x-ray techniques can provide in this context? Well, you get a, a, a direct and detailed probe of the structural dynamics. And if, that's a, if you look at that as sort of a, a quasi-static change, you can say you can look at how phase transitions occur and so forth. Or you can say on a shorter time scale, that same sensitivity gives you a probe of the details of the phonon dynamics. And then another attribute, and I think we'll hear more about this kind of sensitivity in the next talk, is that you can do uh, atomically specific uh, electron dynamics. So, for example, in the case of combining two materials, we have ways of seeing where the electrons go from one material to the other, but we don't really know in a detailed atom by atom basis where the electrons go. So I think this, this will be very relevant in the context of probing catalytic reactions at surfaces and situations where we have a lo localized excitations combined with the 2D materials. Well, uh, in, in my uh, short time, I'd just like to tell you a little bit to relate to this, this aspect, which has uh, been realized in, in some of the initial uh, experiments that have, have been achieved actually combining 2D materials with ultra-fast x-rays. Okay, so uh, this involves uh, looking at the dynamics of um, Van der Waals bonded multilayers. So um, instead of studying just one layer, we, we want to study the weak but important interactions between the layers. And then I'll just tell you briefly about uh, the, the, the first experiment that's actually combined x-rays and uh, uh, ultra-fast x-rays and um, materials down at the uh, 2D materials down at the monolayer level. Okay, so this, this is the part most uh, germane to uh, the subject of the school. Uh, I will just describe a particular experiment. There's sort of a, you know, a limited choice. There's one published experiment so far that involves ultra-fast x-rays and 2D materials, and you guys will get to hear about it. Uh, so we, we, we've studied uh, a, a stacked uh, Thin, thin film of molydisulfide, uh, you know, which I talked about. It's one of these uh, uh, semiconducting 2D materials. And this, this is sort of what the structure looks like. Uh, you know, the, the van der Waals materials have weak bonds between the layers, and, and they're actually, you know, separated by a significant amount. So you can't think of them kind of like 2D sheets that have relatively weak interactions between one another. And what we wanted to understand was something about the dynamics of the inner layer interaction and how the inner layer interactions can be probed and tuned using light. So this experiment was uh, led by Aaron Lindenberg uh, here at the SLAC in Stanford and involved a big team of people, as you can see. And the, the, the key measurements were carried out uh, just, just down the road at LCLS. Okay, so what, what was the experiment like in this case? We, we got uh, multi-layered sample of molydisulfide like this with these, uh, you know, in the basal plane here. And uh, then we excited with an above band cap ultra short optical pulse. And we probed using x-rays in the structural regime where we could see a diffraction pattern. So this, this was a good experiment for somebody who is basically an optical spectroscopist because it was a pretty, pretty simple experiment. Uh, we essentially got the information by looking at a uh, a specular Bragg uh, refl reflection here, and uh, you know, studying uh, just the behavior of this one uh, one diffraction spot. So you guys have probably gone through all of this, but I will give you a little a, a brief review of maybe the you know X-ray, the, the key X-ray ingredients for understanding a simple experiment like this, which is you know what. What defines the position of this, of this spot and what information does it give you? So, uh, you know, that's uh, what, what we're seeing here is just the Bragg um, satisfaction of the Bragg criterion. Uh, so you have uh, a reciprocal lattice vector associated with the periodicity of the crystal planes, which are the Van der Waals layers here. And uh, if you apply conservation of momentum for this reflected beam, you, you have that uh, you know, the, the incident wave vector is uh, going to be equal to this uh, Bragg, uh, Bragg vector associated with the crystal structure plus, uh, I'm sorry, the final wave vector is the initial plus G. And, uh, you know, if you just 
take, take this and uh, recognize then that the, the wave vector is 2 pi over the wavelength. The, the uh, uh, reciprocal lattice vector in this case would be directed as shown and would have a length which is 2 pi over the inner layer spacing times the order of diffraction. Uh, you get directly from that the famous Bragg criterion that the sine of the Bragg angle is given by uh, the x-ray wavelength divided by twice the inner layer spacing and multiplied by the diffracted order. So that's, that's, that's good. Uh, you know, even an optics guy like me can understand that's, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the Bragg peak uh, and, and uh, all is well. Uh, and, and that Bragg peak is going to have characteristics that will reflect the inner layer spacing. So we can look at, you know, the basic response of the layer dynamics using this technique. So uh, here's, here's what we see. This is the reflected spot before excitation. So I have a little audience participation question here. Uh, now, you might, maybe this isn't too convincing, but um, if, you, if, you, if you look at, if you could see it on my computer, you would know that there's another, another kind of fringe here and a fringe up here and actually even a second spot there. What, what are they? So I just went through this argument that you should get a nice Bragg peak. Turns out quite closely spaced, there's, there's these satellite peaks. Any speculations as to what they could be? I'll give you a little clue. So this this is another. Oh, that was, uh, that's news to me. I didn't know that was going to move. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty exciting. I, I, <laughs> uh, how, do, how do I stop it though? Uh, this is this is like going to give away the whole story here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over that one. <laughs> uh, Okay, so, so here are those, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Here, here are those fringes I was describing to you. You get this, sort of this main Bragg peak, and then you get some other, other ones. Uh, well, I'm afraid I got the answer on this slide. You have to multiple choice. Oh, multiple choice. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, I, was, I wasn't quite trained in this. I'm sorry, guys. Um, all right, so it, it, it turns out that this is a, a very nice diagnostic we have because it's actually a reflection of the fact that we're looking at a thin film. So, of course, the Bragg criterion that I described results from taking the Fourier transform of the crystal structure of infinite scale, and then you get uh, moment, rigorous momentum conservation. When you have a finite uh, a sample of finite thickness in the, in the z direction, then you'd really have crystal truncation rods, and you have sort of relaxation of exact momentum conservation. And these extra fringes then reflect the number of layers of, of the crystal in the vertical direction. So that turned out to be very convenient. We could exactly characterize the thickness of the sample. Okay, so that, that's before we excite the sample. Let's skip over that one. So here are some snapshots then taken uh, after excitation. So this is at uh, you know, negative time before the excitation. And this is a little bit after the excitation, and this is at some significant delay. So first of all, you see this uh, is moving in a direction that corresponds to changing the vertical component of, of the uh, scattering vector, Q. And uh, clearly, you can, you can see appreciable changes here. But one of the very curious things is that actually, if you look closely, this spot at 10 picoseconds, it goes up. At 35 picoseconds, it goes down. So this means that uh, we're actually going from a, a region of expansion, which is what you see in longer time delays, and would make a lot of intuitive sense because we're depositing energy and you expect you to get heat. But actually, at short times, you see what corresponds to a contraction of the inner layer spacing. So this was a very interesting and uh, exciting and uh, surprising result to us. If we, uh, if we plot out... Uh, the uh, you know, time-delayed curves, uh, we see quite a bit of interesting behavior going on here. So if you, if you look um, at these two curves, one is for uh, high fluence and one is for low fluence. And in, in, in both cases, you actually see, a, um, sorry, these, these things got displaced, but this negative, uh, this is the, uh, change the strain, the relative change in the lattice spacing. So at early times for both of them, you see a, a negative change. Uh, at low fluence, at longer times, you see a very slight positive change. At higher fluence, you see this negative 
change in the lattice spacing, the contraction, and then you see a clear uh, increase in the lattice spacing. And in addition to that, you see some kind of superposed oscillations in the whole thing. So actually, when you have this very detailed probe of what's going on, you see there's quite a bit going on, all of which was left out of our kind of description based on purely optical probes. Well, uh, anybody know what these oscillations are? I can't reduce it to multiple choice. Leora? Uh, yes, yeah, a very particular type of phonon, actually, because it's, you'll see the time scale is pretty slow. It's about, uh, you know, 10 picoseconds or something. Uh, no, so it's not actually the inner, the inner layer, uh, you know, the breathing mode, you would call that, is actually quite fast compared to this. I mean, it's, it's, a, sl it's a low frequency mode, but a low frequency, typical vibrational frequency would correspond to something like 50 femtoseconds or so. So uh, this is actually a kind of a shock wave. It's an acoustical shock wave where you don't deposit the energy completely uniformly. Uh, so you heat up the front of the sample a little more and then the shock wave propagates back and forth. And, and we know that very well because we, from that x-ray measurement I showed you, we know exactly how thick the sample is. We know the speed of sound. You can compute the period. And, uh, you know, that, that all lines up very well. So you can explore that kind of regime of uh, launching, uh, impulsive launching of acoustical waves. Uh, but, but then the, the sort of new, new physics and the interesting thing was this re initial regime of contraction that you see here. So this is just sort of an expanded version of the same thing. And, you know, it's very clear that you get, a, by exciting the system, by putting this energy in it, you get a lattice contraction. And uh, we, we, we do think we understand that. We did, you know, quite a bit of work in, in exploring the feminology of it. Uh, so at, basically at, at high uh, excitation density for all materials, we see an expansion. That's a very reasonable result because after period of like 100 picoseconds, uh, there's a little bit of this shock wave propagating around, but basically we've heated the material. And when you heat the material, you get, you get thermal expansion. And when you work it out, you know, based on the, the uh, calorimetry, the amount of energy you've deposited, the heat capacity, you figure the temperature rise, it all works. You get the right thermal expansion. And, and we see that in different materials. Um, in this family. But what, what about this compression? Well, that, that emerges actually uh, is, is, dominates at uh, low fluence. Of course, you know, all of, the, all of the effects go to zero with no excitation. But, but what we find is a sublinear scaling of the compressive part. So it, as the fluence goes up, the sublinear scaling that gives rise to the contraction is dominated by the thermal expansion. So does anybody have an idea what, what this could be due to? So you excite the system and we actually, at, when the excitation density is not too high, we see a contraction of the lattice. It's okay, it you know, took us a while to become, first to become convinced that this, this was really correct and then to try to understand you know, where it came from. Well. Um, Let me, let me give you an extra part of an experimental clue. So what we wanted to understand was a little more about what was happening in the material during that time period. And also to explain the fact that this uh, compressive phase was observed in some, some of the materials in the family and not in others. So um, we were able to make a very nice correlation by doing an, a kind of an optical measurement or a, a low frequency optical measurement, which was a, a, on the same, same samples under the same conditions, we looked at the carrier density that we produced. So we did that by looking at the induced conductivity uh, measured with uh, low frequency radiation, with terahertz radiation. And this is the kind of correlation we saw in two different materials. This was in molydisulfide. This was in rhenium disulfide. So if, if this is the, um, the terahertz response, and we, we create a lot of carriers. The carriers screen out the field. We see a decrease in the terahertz transmission. And in the case of uh, molydisulfide, actually like the earlier optical experiment, the purely optical experiments I showed you, uh, we get a recovery of the carrier density over a pretty slow time scale, hundreds of picoseconds here. So 
juice the carriers, and then through radiative and non-radiative decay channels, the carriers go away. Happens in, in rhenium disulfide, there are many, many more defects and so forth. So you produce carriers, but they go away very quickly uh, on the time scale. If you notice, different time scale here, about one, pic one picosecond. So here they last for hundreds of picoseconds. Here they last for maybe one picosecond. And when we correlate uh, this behavior with the x-ray measurements of the strain, we see that you get this uh, compressive strain in molydisulfide on basically a similar period to hundreds of picoseconds. And in the case of rhenium disulfide, uh, actually, you never get much compressive strain. And uh, in fact, the, the time resolution of the x-ray measurements, uh, this particular x-ray measurement was not, not so high. So uh, if there had been a, a compressive strain over this brief time interval, we wouldn't really have seen it experimentally. So we had a very strong experimental correlation between the presence of electronic excitation and the uh, compressive strain, the contraction of the crystal lattice. So clearly, excitation of phonons is known to cause thermal expansion because of the anharmonicity of, of the lattice. But in this early phase, you can have very high electronic excitation densities. And that's what we realized was related to this compressive strain. Uh, it's uh, sort of a longish story, but you can actually predict that by understanding the nature of the van der Waals interactions between the layers. And we could describe this in terms of uh, something physicists love, which is the Casimir force. So the inner, this is a, a sort of a limit if you have two metallic, originally studied in the context of the force between two metallic plates and modifying the, the vacuum modes between them, you get an attractive force. That's actually fundamentally in the same class of interactions as how you describe van der Waals interactions between molecules. But between layers, you, you can describe it here in terms of the dielectric function of the, of, of the, uh, of the media. And uh, in the non-retarded limit, which is relevant here, you, you predict this attractive force, the van der Waals force holding the crystal together. But it has a dependence on the dielectric function of the crystal as shown here. And when you apply this uh, existing formulation in the literature to the change induced by putting in the carriers, you actually find that there's an attractive force which scales with the density of carriers. And it actually scales in, the, in, 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 in this approximation like the square root of the carrier density. And that, in fact, is very compatible with what we saw for the, uh, the compressive strain in the uh, low fluence regime, which also scaled not, the uh, compressive strain scaled uh, like the square root of the fluence, and the carrier density will scale like the, uh, like the fluence. So this is very compatible. Then when you get to high, high uh, excitation densities, you go into the compressive regime. So uh, I think that's good timing. I just want to say that uh, we, we also did a little bit of work going down absolutely to the monolayer limit. Uh, there, the, the diffraction physics is a little bit different. Uh, that relaxation of the conservation of vertical momentum can be understood in terms of these uh, crystal truncation rods, which basically say you can have various out-of-plane momenta. And, uh, we, we studied in a pump probe experiment the details of the temporal evolution of these crystal truncation rods. And that, in fact, uh, is giving us a lot of interesting information about the details of how the electronic excitation couples the in-plane and out-of-plane phonon excitations. So this is still a work in progress. Uh, so just to come to a few conclusions uh, about some of the potential for ultra-fast x-ray techniques, I think I'll put back the slide that I showed you before that uh, we can really, if we can figure out how to, how to uh, marry these two advances in the last decade, ultra-fast x-rays and 2D materials, we have the potential to learn a lot of very important and complementary informa information about electron-phonon interactions and structural changes, and also to extend this to uh, uh, areas of interactions with molecules in the context of catalysis. So I think I'll stop there and uh, welcome any of your questions. Thank you very much. Talks open for questions. Uh, yeah, I thought about the slide. I think it's like you showed the, yeah, maybe I thought it was a good idea. This is the basic schema.
Okay. Right. That's a basic schema. Um, so, I mean, if, if you're, you're sort of thinking if this whole thing moved up, it would shift the spot, is it? Okay, so, I mean, this thing, you know, this is very schematic. So, of course, this, this distance is minute compared to this distance, right? So this is on the order of meters, and this is on the order of nanometers. So that, that actual physical displacement is not going to be seen as a meaningful displacement here. I mean, you might see something like that if you were doing uh, an X-ray interferometric measurements. So you could see the change in the top position, but I, I don't think that would be significant in the geometry we're using here. We're basically sensitive to the change in angle. Maybe that's a direction for another experiment. Yeah. No. Well, so, um, you know, damage is always a limitation in these experiments because you have almost an infinite source of x-rays and, you know, even more to come in LCLS too. Uh, if, if you compare it to the, the regime of, of, you know, looking at diffraction patterns from very small particles or individual molecules, you actually do have a lot more material here. So you, you, you can use lower, lower uh, X-ray fluences than you would in that case. So in particular, I mean, this somehow looks like the X-ray beam is about one atom wide, but in, in, in reality, it was more like a millimeter sized spot. So it's not highly focused. And um, the, the, the multi-layer st samples were absolutely stable and we had no problem whatsoever with X-ray damage. This monolayer experiment, we were more constrained. Uh, let's see if I have any data here to give you an idea. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can sort of see what the signal to noise was, and, and that was not a, that was still not a single shot experiment, but uh, this, the signal was pretty weak, and, and we were somewhat constrained by cumulative damage in the sample. But, but I guess the, the sort of the broad answer is compared to diffract and destroy, we're still looking at a lot of atoms, even in the monolayer case. Are you, are you referring to the, the X-ray or the optical measurements? Um, well, the, the, the one, one important trick to get enough signal, basically, is, is what you see here. So this thing was done at grazing incidents. You interact with more, more atoms. And it, it was important to have a large sample also. Um, and then we, I, I guess one other, so there are two things. One is the signal and the other is the noise, right? So, um, you know, both of these things were enhanced by this grazing incident geometry. So you, you have more sensitivity than monolayer, less, less from the bulk. We also put this on a uh, well-structured crystalline surface that had no Bragg peaks in the same vicinity. So uh, those were sort of the key ingredients. And there, I mean, there, there is already a, a large body of literature, and you'll, you'll probably hear more about it um, next talk, in which you know, use X-ray crystallography techniques to look at surface structure. So it, it, it is in you know, the regime where you have enough signal. If you, if you set up everything right to exclude the bulk and use grazing incidents. All right, then that's uh, thanks for me. Yeah.
to be uh, given by Demosthenes Sokaras uh, from SSRL, and he's going to talk about characterization of catalysts with operando hard X-ray spectroscopy. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much for everyone. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so in this uh, in this talk, we will try to talk a little bit about more, uh, let's say, from more for a fundamental perspective differences we can see with, uh, when we are uh, adopting X-ray spectroscopy to characterize materials and um, that can be in relevance to catalysis but as well as uh, beyond that. So it's going to be uh, not in the ultra fast way if you like, although the same kind of uh, fingerprints or chemical fingerprints or, or spectral fingerprints or the same types of approach are also applicable for uh, uh, dynamic uh, uh, processes that usually are commonly uh, after at, the, at LCLS. Uh, we're going to have some introductory parts here that has to do with spectroscopy, has to do with techniques, uh, have to do uh, with uh, uh, some things that we should uh, be taking care of when, when, we are, when we're going to do spectroscopy experiments and, uh, and especially operato kind of, uh, of approaches. I mean, most likely this picture, you have seen it many times in this school, I assume. It's, uh, so in the facilities we have here at SLAC when it comes to uh, X-ray sources that are both co uh, are the LCLS for the X-ray free electron laser and the SSRL when it comes to uh, the more static kind of measurements that we will try to approach here. Uh, SSRL in specific has uh, a typical third generation synchrotron radiation facility. It has uh, X-rays that they span all the way from the soft to the hard X-rays. And uh, we have uh, beam lines that they uh, have uh, insertion devices and baked in magnets and uh, wigglers, undulators, and, and, and all this kind of, uh, of, uh, of sources that somebody can find in any uh, secret radiation facility. And uh, at the same time, we have this camps of base time resolve mode that potentially we can even go down to a few tens of picoseconds if we want to. On the other hand, of course, LCLS, right, is uh, again a soft and hard X ray free electron laser that they're taking advantage of the very short pulses uh, available there and the very high power per pulse, we can do all these uh, time result measurements. Uh, so here I'm going to focus more on spectroscopy, right? And uh, once we talk about spectroscopy, what we practically do with that is just to, we want practically to set the light to the electronic structure of materials, of molecules, of processes, and so on and so forth. And what does that mean practically is that we want to probe the chemical environment or the coordination of some, uh, of some uh, uh, complex and the way we do that is by probing practically the occupied and unoccupied orbitals or states. It depends on the material we have, uh, we want to study. And the way we do it is by probing, let's say, the energy difference between transitions, intensity between transitions, and symmetry between transitions that all together somehow give information about electronic structure. Uh, X-ray spectroscopy mostly deals with uh, core level uh, electrons, so that means we're taking electrons that are very inside, uh, very close to the, uh, to the nucleus of, of the atom, and we try to excite them in, in a, a discrete or continuum states in, 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 uh, outside. And uh, we have two main ways that we can uh, detect, uh, to, that we can approach X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, what, when we are trying to see occupied states and when we try to see unoccupied states. And the way we commonly do that for example, in the unoccupied states, we are coming with some X-ray that has specific energy that can promote a specific electron from a core level to some continuum or discrete state. And when it comes to the occupied state, once we form, let's say, a vacancy, in an inner cell vacancy, we simply look how this relaxation of the atom occurs, and in this way, we can probe the occupied states as they are projecting in these uh, vacancies we create. And through these main processes, that I just described, we take all the sensitivity for the different kind of, um, of spectroscopies we're going to follow. And I, and I will give some examples here. For example, when we talk for the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, that means we are taking an electron from a core cell and we are taking to some unoccupied uh, uh, state. Uh, so we probe practically the lower unoccupied states. Uh, one very specific, and I'm going to mention it a few times, and it was mentioned uh, briefly in the uh, previous talk as well, one of the most important advantages right, of uh, X-ray spectroscopy compared to other techniques is the element specificity, that somebody, by tuning the emission, uh, the, the incident energy, can probe a very specific atomic species compared to everything else that is available in a, in a sample. And this can be very advantageous when we have very dilute samples, when we want, uh, for example, imagine we have a 
a metallic species uh, and uh, around thousands and thousands of oxygen and nitrogen of organic uh, matter, and then you can still try to specifically excite the specific atom and uh, distinguish the signal from there compared to everything else, something that is not feasible with many techniques that are not uh, element specific. Uh, and at the same time, all these transitions now that, that we do are in the, in the very fast uh, domain. So practically, we are probing frozen geometries most of the times at the, at the, at the, at the time of, of, of probing. And we can get information, let's say, when we do X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we can get information that relates to oxidation state. We can get information that is more uh, brought to the chemical environment, even under sem similar oxidation states that are related to the ligands. And uh, we can even get information from very, very weak uh, kind of, uh, of interactions, like the uh, hydrogen bonding, for example. And a very typical example is in the sensitivity of oxygen K X-ray absorption to, to water molecule in different uh, phases, which is uh, purely uh, dependent on the hydrogen bonding. Uh, when it comes to X-ray emission now, there are different kinds of information you can get from there, which can be complementary or uh, to, to the ones from X-ray absorption. And it's some, in many things, there are similarities. That uh, There are reasons that somebody is going to select the one for, from the other. But there are also information that can be unique. Uh, for example, if we see here the relaxation uh, options of um, of a, a manganese uh, atom, for example, we have this emission light uh, upon the presence of one uh, score hole that we create with one incident photon. We can um, have then a sequence of relaxation mechanisms with different probabilities, which we call the K-alpha lines, the K-beta lines, and the K-valence lines, which can have different sensitivities and different effects. Uh, for example, the K-alpha and the K-beta can be really sensitive to spin state. It's actually K-beta one of the few ways that we can be very highly sensitive to the spin state of, of, of the metals. Uh, K-alpha to the same degree uh, in a similar manner is also sensitive to oxidation state and spin state. And we have also this projection of the valence uh, lines directly to the 1S hole, where these are really practically sensitive to the, very, to the legal environment, to the actual valence uh, state of, uh, of uh, an atom. Uh, for example, here we can see a different uh, uh, oxidation states and uh, structures of, of manganese uh, oxides, where somebody can really see with the K-beta X-ray emission, can be really sensitive to practically the spin state of, of manganese, while in the valence uh, side, still we can see very, very important differences uh, that uh, can give us very high sensitivity when we try to uh, distinguish this kind of species. Uh, so now, up to now, I talked to this, right, to the X-ray emission side, which is the relaxation channel, and the X-ray absorption channel, which is the excitation channel. Uh, another way now that we can see these things a little bit together is uh, in this, what we call in the last X-ray scattering scheme, or in the scheme of we can both scan the incident. Uh, we, we, uh, to go on, uh, to emphasize further back, is uh, here for the X-ray emission, we simply need to excite the inner core electron to some unoccupied state, right, to some continuum state with no, with no any resonance. But if now we see the dependence of the incident radiation excitation and the emission energy, we can get what we call this uh, uh, RICS, this resonant elastic X-ray scattering came up, that can give us a combination of occupied and unoccupied states in a, in a, in a very uh, detailed way. And this way, you can get information about the final states effects and so on and so forth. Uh, one more simplified and more practical approach when we are using these uh, RICS uh, maps is what we call this high resolution X-ray absorption. And the way we do that, for example, here, I want to go directly to the final result in order to show for uh, one example here how when somebody detects the fluorescence radiation with high energy resolution can practically le lead to an X-ray absorption spectra which has much higher energy resolution compared to the conventional X-ray absorption. Which is in the conventional X-ray absorption, somebody either detects the overall fluorescence emission or either sees in a transmission way that they just uh, try to see how much of the X-rays are absorbed in, in, in the sample. And they are, uh, let's say, equivalent to this uh, total fluorescent yield uh, kind of, uh, of um, signal. And so the advantage when somebody uses a high resolution, uh, let's say, kind of, uh, of detection is that practically is doing this cut in this uh, RIGS map and practically remove some broadening that comes from the uh, inner, inner, inner state uh, core hole. Because uh, practically these maps have some broadening effects, and the broadening effects are purely related to the lifetime, which means how fast, right, how long-lived are the core uh, levels. 
and generally for the heavier atoms, uh, the core levels have quite uh, they have quite a short lifetime. That means they have quite broad uh, levels, and uh, as in this uh, matrix here, we can see it by by this arrow about the initial state and uh, then uh, the final state. And so by somebody doing a cut in this map, then this is the way that we get all these uh, high end resolution. Uh, I'm emphasizing a little bit this technique because we use it extensively when it comes to, to different catalysis, uh, catalysis uh, uh, projects, as we're going to see afterwards. And the reason for that is um, twofold. Uh, first of all, we can have uh, right this um, enhanced features because we can see a little bit further small details in, in some spectra that otherwise would be harder to distinguish. Uh, due to the suppression of the core hole, but at the same time we have this enhanced detection sensitivity because practically when somebody detects with high energy resolution the fluorescence lines of, 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 uh, of an element practically is rejecting all scattering background that is typical with uh, normal detectors which usually makes things harder to detect when we go to really dilute samples. So this is the twofold, if, we, if you want me to say it like that, uh, advantages when somebody uses high resolution because we can both enhance the chemical sensitivity by seeing in more details, right, uh, the, the X-ray absorption spectra, and at the same time, we can more reliably and more uh, nicely sub, uh, subtract and, 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 and uh, omit all the scattering that comes from, from uh, some uh, dilute sample, and in this way, you can go really down to very dilute samples, uh, even way down to sub-monolayer kind of um, detection. So if, it, if it's here to summarize once more all the techniques that uh, somebody, or most of the techniques somebody can uh, use, again we have the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we're getting electrons from the inner levels, we promote these uh, electrons to unoccupied uh, states uh, uh, in the lower uh, side of, the, of, of, uh, of uh, closer to the uh, Fermi level and the band gaps. And in this way we can probe the chemical environment, the oxidation state, symmetry, spin, depends on how we do the interpretation and the approach to, to, the, to the spectra. And uh, the X-ray emission on the other side is a subsequent process. First of all, we take an electron. We are moving this inner electron to, to continuum uh, far away from the atom. And we, just, we then simply monitor the relaxation of the outer electrons or the inner electrons through uh, the initial core hole. And this gives us sensitivity, again, to a chemical environment and, and spin state and uh, legal identification sometimes. Uh, another technique now that we can do similar things and we can uh, again uh, check a little bit the unoccupied density of states is again by the inelastic X-ray scattering. Uh, I talked a little bit before about the resonant um, inelastic scattering, but also there is a non-resonant inelastic scattering phenomenon that actually you can come with an electron uh, with a uh, uh, photon that has a much higher energy than the absorption uh, energy. And still, there is a small probability for this electron to be promoted to, no, to an uh, unoccupied state and re-emit, re-scatter practically the remaining energy with another uh, uh, photon. In this way, we have some uh, non-resonant elastic stress scattering, which is another technique that is also used uh, sometimes for, uh, due to the uh, advantages that uh, it, comes, uh, it comes with it. But we will not focus too much in this, this short talk uh, about that. So X-rays overall, right? The main advantage compared to, uh, to many other techniques and why this is uh, uh, very useful for many practical applications is the penetration depth that we can have, right? They can easily penetrate uh, some materials. And in this way, we have some very flexible uh, sample environment uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, again, we always come down to core level transitions, which is our element, specificity, uh, element specific. So we can really probe specific atoms in the presence of, of, a, of a plethora of other atoms that coexist in the sample. Uh, they, they fall under very specific selection rules, and this gives us a lot of uh, 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 tools in order to explain uh, the density of states that we are practically uh, probing with those uh, techniques. Um, and here again is uh, the, the summary of, of these things, element specific, size specific, and practically the partial resolving of density of states that give us information about hybridization, valency, symmetry, and spin. Uh, obviously now based on the energy, right, uh, and the energy that the X-ray sources uh, can provide, we can access practically almost all the periodic table. Here at Slack, for example, and in other facilities as well, we provide X-rays in the whole uh, spectrum from the very soft X-rays to the very hard X-rays, and in this way 
we can mostly capture the whole periodic table when it comes uh, to spectroscopy. Uh, at the same time, the capabilities at LCLS and uh, can also help the time resolve when it comes to ultra fast dynamics, but the slower dynamics can also be resolved with uh, conventional uh, synchrotron facilities. Uh, as we discuss, X-rays can pro probe uh, elaborate material environments, right? So this gives a whole flexibility to actually study processes in uh, real uh, conditions, by example, uh, high pressure studies between uh, inside diamond anvil cells, in situ studies in batteries or electrochemistry, as we will see, and of course, there is some flexibility in the in vacuum environments that we can still do the same things with a more high, a higher surface sensitivity. Uh, now, let's discuss a little bit about X-ray detection schemes, because obviously, right, to develop all those techniques, we need uh, well-defined monochromatic beams from, uh, for, for the excitation part, and these are provided by synchrotron facilities and the, and the beam lines. And on the other end, we need to detect X-rays, especially when you do things in the fluorescent modes. And uh, currently, the way that we detect right, X-rays comes mostly from uh, photodiodes, our ionization chambers is the most common way people are doing it when they do normal X-ray absorption, conventional X-ray absorption techniques, as well as using uh, semiconductor uh, detectors, which are based on silicon or germanium, like silicon drift, uh, uh, that are lately uh, mostly used. Uh, these detectors, of course, are uh, single photon uh, counting detec detectors. They ca ha can have very high efficiency and a solid angle, which de defines right how dilute the potential samples you can measure. And uh, at the same time, they have a very extended detection rate. So at the same time, let's say with a silicon drift detector, somebody can uh, simultaneously detect an uh, energy that is at 1 kV and at 10 kV in the same spectrum, and in this way can select which energy wants to integrate or plot or, or whatever. So these kind of detectors, they provide very, very big flexibility when it comes to experiments. Can somebody easily move from one element to the other without a, a great hassle, and, and so on and so forth. However, the, the, a limitation to some degree is the energy resolution that is in the order of 100, 150 EV when it comes to, to hard X-rays and, and beyond. Uh, but that said, it's a very advantageous kind of detection scheme because mostly of the high solid angle, you can bring the detector as close to your sample as your sample environment permits. And as we said before, due to the simultaneous detection of, of various uh, emission lines simultaneously. Uh, now, if somebody wants to resolve X-rays with high resolution, you need to move to different kind of schemes. And one sch scheme for that is to use the diffraction. So as it was uh, briefly discussed before, a diffraction is in for specific for a, a diffraction of specific energy happens at specific angles. So by taking into advantage this uh, correlation between energy and angle, when uh, X-rays interact with uh, crystal materials, somebody can even consider schemes of detecting in a monochromatic way a, a radiation. So a typical way that we we, we hear in other place detect uh, X-rays with high energy resolution exceed significantly the energy resolution of conventional detectors like the ones we discussed previously, is that uh, by using uh, some analyzer, what we call analyzer, a crystal analyzer, and practically use the diffraction of that analyzer on specific angles to get the monochromaticity. Because by placing the crystal, the, the crystal to different Bragg angles, practically we're selecting different energies. And this is a very common way uh, for monochromatizing X-rays to use for X-ray emission spectroscopy and the resonant elastic X-ray scattering and the high resolution X-ray absorption, as we discussed. Um, now, as far as slack, um, there are several capabilities for all these techniques that we just uh, uh, briefly presented. Photoemission spectroscopy, fluorescence, uh, yield X-ray absorption, X-ray emission with, uh, with uh, uh, Bragg optics, and uh, photodiode-based multi-element solid-state detector. So we have a suit and a bank of very uh, different, uh, different, different instrumentation in order to attack all these kind of techniques. And based on which, we have built uh, a multidisciplinary research project, a research program that uh, spans, obviously, in the whole science, including material science, biology, and catalysis that uh, most specifically we will uh, discuss here. Uh, 
So when we're discussing about catalysis and the things I will uh, briefly present, we mostly discuss about right electrocatalysis, gas phase catalysis, photocatalysis. There are different ways you can trigger these uh, catalytic uh, reactions. And uh, obviously, each of these fields has its very own specificities when it comes to the experiments, when it comes to, to the sample environments to use. This is uh, very important. And the scientific uh, questions uh, to answer. Uh, ultimately, what we try to do is try to probe the catalyst under actual operating conditions. And uh, what we try to resolve is, let's say, the ultimate goal of catalysis, right, is to find what are the active sites, what are the, re the reaction mechanism, and how we can really set the light to these uh, fundamental uh, questions in order to design a better catalyst, more efficient catalyst, in order to, for, for different kinds of, of purposes. This has to do with uh, a water splitting, can have to do with uh, CO hydrogenation, can have to do with uh, methane uh, oxidation, and so on and so forth. So it's a plethora of uh, chemical reactions and uh, a very extended research when it comes to catalysts and catalysis and modern ways on, uh, to try to, to, to do more renewable uh, uh, sources-based catalysis. And we try here to develop all those techniques and sample environments to permit this to happen. Again, what we need to keep in mind, right, is that ultimately we want to perform those studies under realistic conditions and under conditions that are actually during operation of, 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 of the catalyst. And this can, be, can bring different, uh, how to say, difficulties uh, in the sense of that, uh, let's say, when we talk, as we will see, when we will talk about gas phase reactions, this can many times have to happen in very high pressures, let's say several tens of bars, it can happen in high, in high temperatures. So somebody has to come up with designs, right, that can, X-rays can really probe, so X-rays can penetrate some materials to reach to the actual catalyst that you want to study, and then X-rays to be able to come out and uh, be detecting in the appropriate way. And at the same time, it's, uh, and, uh, it's something I will emphasize even a little bit further, is that we need to design the experiment in a way that is also appropriate for the, for the X-rays. When you're discussing for egg hard X-rays, egg hard X-rays are mostly bulk sensitive. So once we have uh, some uh, uh, a sample, right, that is going to be in the orders of micrometers or, or or something like that, and we are after a very specific element, let's say iron, copper, whatever the element might be, uh, X-rays will necessarily probe all these atomic species that are there, and they're going to provide accumulative uh, information that is the superposition of all the potential different species of the same atom that coexist on the sample. So it's really important when we are trying to design experiments and we try to do uh, catalytic reactions in the given case to make sure that we have their materials that are really participating in what we do, that they participate in the reaction, and it's not something that is just being there without right, uh, participating on, on, on that. For example, most of the catalytic reactions are usually happening on surfaces, right? So uh, assuming somebody has a very big particle, let's say you know, tens of hundreds of nanometers, and something happened only in the surface, that is in the very first layer, then if you come with a hard X-ray, practically you're going to probe all the nanoparticles, right? And uh, the actual process happens only in the surface. So the, the, the complication this brings is that practically the signal you're going to detect by 99.9% .9 is going to be of the material that doesn't participate at all. And this is common issues that uh, we see many times, especially uh, when we, col we collaborate with, um, with colleagues that have only catalysis background or, or, or uh, different techniques or applying different techniques that are only sensitive to the active sites. Or for example, when somebody is doing electrochemistry and then uh, his uh, det uh, instrument of detection is just a current that is uh, just a recording, it's very common not to uh, have uh, in mind that the material can be extra material there in the catalyst that just doesn't participate in the electrochemistry. And so in this, not all, it's not uh, visible from that sense. But at the same time, it's going to be very visible at the x-rays. Uh, so just to bring one first example here of an uh, electrochemistry that we were doing uh, the, the last uh, few years. Uh, here we're trying to see the iron-nickel electrocatalyst for a water splitting for this uh, oxygen evolution reaction under uh, realistic conditions. So in order to do uh, an electro electrochemical uh, reaction, right, practically you need a catalyst, uh, 
fluid that is uh, electrically connected with the electrodes to and a potential stat that uh, gives uh, uh, the, the electrons uh, to drive the reaction. And at the same time, you need an electrolyte in order to provide the water, right, and the electrolyte uh, for, uh, for the reaction to happen. So any experiments that are designed need to be such that the x-rays can come, they have to penetrate the, the liquid, they have to reach the, uh, the, the actual uh, catalyst, and the detecting the x-rays, they need to be able to make it out of of uh, the liquid and then go to the instrument that is uh, detecting the x-rays. So a careful consideration of, of how somebody designs a cell to actually make this needs a little bit of uh, thinking, while at the same time preserving all these elements that are necessary for the reaction to be representative of what's uh, is going on. Uh, that said, in this uh, given case, right, we did uh, this uh, nickel iron uh, uh, catalyst. It was a, a very thin layer of, uh, of less than one nanometer deposited on an electrode. And there we just try to see uh, where this, let's say, enhanced uh, activity, the high activity of the nickel iron compound comes when somebody compared it if you have only nickel or only iron. So there is this uh, synergistic um, uh, activity when these two materials are inside and through uh, some detail, uh, high resolution X-ray absorption, we try to do then through the pre-edge analysis and uh, all um, the study that is uh, included in this paper, we managed to see that uh, actually the reason for this uh, intense uh, enhanced uh, activity is uh, because um, uh, some iron cations, they are getting, uh, they are incorporated into some uh, sites of this uh, gamma uh, nickel uh, hydroxide. And this dramatically uh, changes the chemical bonding of these cations with the intermediates involved in this uh, OER. Um, again, to, to develop this experiment, right, we had to design the experiment such that we are able to get through electrolyte, go to see a very thin layer, and then the, uh, get the X-rays out. And uh, we used this high resolution detection scheme that I mentioned before. And this was mandatory for the study in the sense of Electrolyte-based experiments, they tend to give a lot of uh, scattering because x-rays come in, in, in and uh, come out for, from the electrolytes, which is uh, producing quite some scattering radiation. Actually, it's going to be orders of, um, order to orders of magnitude more intense than the fluorescence intensity of the, of, of, of the thin material. And by using a high-resolution detection scheme, some, somebody practically rejects all this uh, scattering radiation and just records the fluorescence emission in this way to be able to get very uh, reliable uh, spectra in short uh, acquisition times. Uh, in the same way here, let's say an, a, another case is uh, we have studied in a very similar cell and in a very similar way is uh, the electrochemical water oxidation of uh, particle uh, nanoparticles. Here we have some very small 1.2 nanometers uh, nanoparticles that are uh, made of platinum, right? And we try to use uh, the same technique by uh, checking the, the platinum oxidation state during the different um, uh, potentials of the uh, CV curves of, of, of this uh, particle during the OER uh, conditions. Uh, and again here, through the peak position of the X-ray absorption, that's, this is very sensitive to the oxidation state of the, of, of, uh, the platinum uh, species, we were able to give insights about the performance of this catalyst and the, and the oxidation state, the chemical environment of this catalyst under the actual uh, operating uh, conditions between metallic and oxidative, oxidative, oxidative character. Uh, for example, here we can see that for the, out of uh, the analysis of all the X-ray absorption spectra, we're able to see how the platinum nanoparticles changes with these uh, hydroxides and this uh, PTOX at the, at the very high potentials by analyzing the white lines of, uh, of platinum. Uh, in a similar way, uh, we have done uh, this kind of study in uh, gold uh, manganese uh, oxide thin films, uh, where again, by using this uh, uh, high resolution X ray absorption, we were able to detect uh, manganese uh, spectra. Uh, what is specific thing about this uh, gold manganese uh, catalyst is that uh, manganese gold is five times more active than, uh, than manganese. So, for, uh, we were trying to investigate why when somebody adds some. Uh, Called uh, co-catalyst in the in the sample, uh, the activity becomes max higher, and through some higher resolution X-ray absorption spectra, we clearly during the operating conditions, right during different potentials in the uh, CV curves, we were able to 
determine that uh, manganese assumes a higher oxidation state under reaction conditions. I want the gold is present, and this excused uh, this uh, high, highly higher activity. Uh, another example here uh, is uh, uh, again in, in, in the field of electrochemistry, where uh, here we're studying the, uh, the influence of a, mo uh, of a molybdenum coating in uh, platinum. Uh, we're actually uh, trying to see how the overall water splitting re requires, because the overall water splitting requires oxygen insertive cathodes for preventing the reverse reaction. And um, Angel that participates in, in this uh, school, and uh, we did this uh, work together back in the day. Uh, we, you, we practically coated uh, electrochemically uh, platinum with molybdenum, uh, which is an acetol and electrocatalyst, which is very important for the, when we are under hydrogen uh, evolution conditions. And we were trying to figure out what is the role of molybdenum in order how it perfects the platinum catalyst uh, and uh, without reducing the, the practical activity. And uh, through some in situ uh, so, uh, measurements, we were able to detect the exact uh, uh, state of molybdenum and how it was uh, trying to protect platinum in order to remain uh, platinum reduced. And practically, we figure out that the molybdenum acts like a membrane that confines the availability of oxygen and hydrogen near the platinum, um, uh, near the platinum uh, electrode. And in this way, is preventing the OER uh, reaction, or ORR reaction uh, in, 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 the, in a platinum um, electrocatalysis. electrocatalysis. Uh, now I have a few minutes more, right? And uh, I'm just going to fast uh, show a little bit the gas phase catalysis uh, capabilities uh, uh, we have. Uh, again, when it comes to gas phase catalysis, we have a metallic, right, a, a metallic uh, kind of, of catalyst. And then uh, under very high uh, pressures of, of, of gases, we, are, uh, we, we need to figure out what's happening with the active sites, what's happening with the catalyst uh, stability, what's happening with the different steps of, of, of reactions. In order to be able to um, simulate under realistic conditions what's happening in industrial catalysis sites and so on and so forth, somebody needs to build a catalytic reactor that is able to simulate this uh, kind of conditions and at the same time permit the x-rays to come in and out of, of this environment. Uh, thankfully, there are these kind of materials that can do that. For example, here we built a reactor that was based on a beryllium uh, tube. It's a beryllium 0.8 uh, millimeter thick uh, tube. Practically, it's permittable to hard x-rays. X-rays, uh, hard x-rays can uh, penetrate very uh, efficiently in the order of 50, 60 percent. It depends on the energy from 5 to, to 10 kV even more as we uh, go into higher, harder x-rays. And at the same time, some materials like these are uh, st strong enough in order to be able to sustain very high pressures, like up to the 50 bar that here is needed, and uh, can survive up to very high temperatures. Uh, so here at Slack, we have built uh, an overall reactor, which is, is based on a beryllium tube. And we have mass flow controllers, uh, GC or mass specs coupled to, to, to this uh, <coughs> setups in order to be able to make, make in situ the reaction under real representative conditions and at the same time actually do a full operando measurement by measuring at the same time the catalysis pieces and the, all the synthesis products that are, uh, are produced. Uh, we, we have used these capabilities uh, a few times for, uh, for different kinds of, of uh, systematic uh, research. One uh, uh, of, of uh, applications we have been doing is uh, trying to understand the highly debatable uh, uh, copper zinc uh, catalyst that is commonly used for uh, CO2 reduction to methanol. It's uh, the most uh, uh, used uh, catalyst for methanol uh, synthesis in, in, in industry. And there are lots of debating in terms of what are the exact active sites, what exactly is doing the, um, is promotes the reaction, uh, how, what it dictates the, the the selectivity in terms of the synthesis of uh, uh, methanol versus the, the CO. And there are many, many open questions as far as these uh, catalysts. And uh, here we try to do some uh, preliminary study in terms of to see how the uh, copper and zinc uh, extra absorption is. They behave under realistic conditions uh, and how they change when we change the temperature in order to promote those reactions. And here we have uh, some um, 
information in, in, as, for, as, as far as the zinc versus zinc oxide behavior in different temperatures and different pressures that are in, level, in relevance to CO2. This is an ongoing effort with, uh, that uh, doesn't only need experimental uh, observations, right? The, the, the important thing when it comes to X-ray absorption and to different kind of techniques, we, we need a more holistic approach of, of the interpretations, which is usually they uh, include the theory efforts, they need interpretation efforts, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But being able in the first step, right, to have some reliable and representative experimental data that mimic the actual conditions of a reaction is, is really important. And uh, another here uh, example is that uh, we, we use this uh, high resolution X ray absorption again in order to uh, study this uh, single site iridium uh, catalyst, uh, where practically we were able, through the detailed uh, interpretation of, 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 of the recorded data, practically to see the ethylene versus uh, CO2 uh, binding on an iridium atom, uh, in a, which is a single site catalyst. Single site catalysts are uh, very, at the moment, uh, a lot, uh, very much in fashion of, of catalysis. In because they give this opportunity of uh, designing and uh, engineering uh, cat catalysts in such a way that promote very specific reactions. And it was one of the first demonstration experiments showing how we can really detect such of, uh, of uh, ligands on these metallic species under realistic conditions for extremely light dilute sample as are the single uh, site catalysts. Uh, so closing here, I just want to emphasize right that the uh, X-ray spectroscopies can indeed be the powerful tool for operando catalytical studies. Uh, the characteristics they have that they can penetrate through materials, they can um, have the element specificity that is really important for, uh, for especially for uh, very dilute samples, gives really, really important uh, advantages for the X-ray spectroscopy uh, to be complementary to other techniques and provide very useful insights. Uh, current developments, right, around elements to go all the all over the periodic table, from very uh, soft X-rays to harder X-rays, <coughs> and of course across a wide range of concentrations by the development of proper experimental setups that they have the throughput to support that. Uh, important to remember is that the careful consideration of the sample and sample environment is really critical for somebody getting something representative when it comes to catalytical uh, reactions, because X-rays, again, especially the hard X-rays, can probe the overall bulk information of, in, in our sample. And last but not least, the uh, operando catalysis program is a main research direction uh, here at SLAC. And with that, yeah, I want to like to end and any questions. Sure, sure. Yeah, actually, it's it's easier if we see it directly, right, on this map, because practically what we do, let's say, when. When someone is doing a conventional X-ray absorption, right, then somebody does not have the resolution to, de to, to separate this line. So practically, when somebody detects in a normal absorption uh, scheme, it's going to project all this information in, down, right? Because practically, you're going to integrate all this information at the same time. And this has obviously these tails that comes from the broadening uh, that comes, let me, oh, sorry. I have that. It has this main broadening that has comes from the lifetime of the core hole. And one, somebody is going to make a slice here, then practically is going to simply detect this part of, of the emission line. 
assuming you project everything down in this energy, you're going to see a little bit more intensity because this part of the emission line, right? This part of the emission line is going to give you some contribution. But if you are up here, you have no contribution at all. So if by simply projecting this down, somebody is going to get is going to get the blue line. And if you're just going to integrate along this dotted line, because you don't get any contribution from this side or any contribution from that side, it is going to get the red line. Because But the thing is that this comes is dominated by the lifetime, this uh, diagonal uh, broadening is dominated by the broadening of the, of the starting uh, core hole. And the starting core hole always has a bigger broadening than anything else. And this comes through the core for lifetime, right? Because once you have a. I mean, this, right? I mean, you can see it as an elastic scattering process for sure, but this is the holistic picture of an emission line, right? And the way you are interpreting this is, is by suppressing the, uh, the lifetime uh, into. by getting the higher resolution of the detection channel. But the, the, what it dominates, right, the specific in the emission direction, in the excitation direction, is in one direction you have the broadening of the initial state, and the other direction you have the broadening of the final state. And just because the initial state, usually in the X-ray absorption, has a much, much wider uh, broadening compared to the final state, then uh, these things work. As you said, if the final state and the initial state had the same uh, broadening, then it wouldn't work as good. Yeah, this is uh, clear. I think so. All right. Then let's uh, thank uh, Dimas and also Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.